right from the Vedic, Vedic period, in the Vedic period, it's always the description of this region is Asetu Himachala Paryantam. From the region bounded on all three sides by the sea up to the snowy mountains. Himachala means Hima Achala, snowy mountains to the region bounded by the seas is the Bharata Desha. If we look at the common factors, race, religion and culture, country and language, we have a common ethos. There is a common base language in terms of grammar, in terms of syntax, in terms of script. All of these scripts are evolved from the same uh, Brahmic family of scripts. You have the same structure, the, uh, uh, the Kavarga, Tavarga, Chavarga kind of structure to all our alphabets. You have uh, the same very similar rules of grammar. The syntax and the vocabulary might change depending on state to state, depending on region to region. But there is a common link language and uh, if I may say so, uh, till very recent times our common link language was Sanskrit. I have not prepared a slide deck or anything uh, and uh, I will just have a few notes which I will be using as a reference while I will be talking. And uh, a lot of this is from my own understanding and observation and reading. So I must give you advance warning that this is very subjective. So almost everything that I say as a make as a statement or say might be uh, you know open to uh, debate and open to questioning. And uh, not all of you may agree with all of the all of what I say, but uh, this is just uh, please bear in mind that this is very subjective as. Our discussion on this subject is very nascent and we don't want to take any ideological standpoint. Uh, so if you ask about these subjects, there would be a specific standpoint from uh, the viewpoint of certain groups of people in the country. Another group of people in the country will have a very, very uh, rigid standpoint on what these uh, topics mean. However, uh, what I have tried to do is to try to analyze uh, from a historical perspective. Uh, the nature of state states and statecraft in India from a historical perspective and try to give a perspective on how things worked across time in different at different points in time and try to evolve and see possibly how we could use that and apply that to our current situation that we find ourselves in. So at the outset I uh, the the uh, idea was that uh, uh, we draw a little bit more eyeballs. So the word Hindu Rashtra is usually draws more eyeballs. But uh, my discussion, what I'm going to be talking about mostly is about Rajya, not about Rashtra. There will be a few, initially we'll start with the definition of the Rashtra and then go on to discussing the Rajya because uh, there are two things. The Rashtra, by Rashtra, we mean the nation or the nationhood or the group of people who are part of the Hindu nation whether and question the basic principle of whether there is a Hindu Rashtra at all and what is this Hindu Rashtra is consists consists of and then we go into saying that suppose this nation governs itself not without any fetters of any uh, baggage uh, from the past of uh, any certain constitutional principles or constitution uh, which is derived from constitutions elsewhere in the world but based on its own history, what would a Hindavi Swarajya look like? And for that, I have tried to uh, gather as many references as I can. Uh, one very important source is the Arthashastra, uh, Kautilya's Arthashastra, which I have tried to use as a reference. Then I have tried to use as a reference uh, the Agnyapatra, uh, promulgated by the Marathas. And uh, tried to use as reference later thinkers, modern thinkers and uh, most of the modern thinkers who have spoken about the Hindu Rashtra and about Hindavi Swarajya have been from the Sangha. So I will reference uh, Guruji Golwalkar, uh, Dattopan Tengdi and uh, Gurudat Vaid. These are some of the prominent thinkers from the Sangha who have spoken about the various aspects of uh, Hindu Rashtra, about Dharma, Rajniti and Shiksha, which, uh, which are, uh, if, if you look at uh, in terms of Rajya, uh, what really matters is dharma, the Rajniti, the political situation and the polity and Shiksha. How do we pass on and keep this uh, civilizational values alive for a future generation? So let me start with the definition of a Rashtra, the Hindu nation. 
So I begin with uh, uh, who has really thought through the definition of a nation and question what are the things that go into defining a nation. So a very good reference for this is from Guruji Golwalkar's writings where he says that to define a nation you must specify what is the country in which that nation is held, the country or the state which holds the nation the race, religion and culture and language. So Guruji goes on to say that for if you say that there is a nation, uh, a nation must have a country of its own. It must have a country that it calls its country. So if you look at uh, for example the uh, Chinese nation, the Chinese nation is essentially the inheritor of the Chinese civilization and the Chinese state and the Chinese country, the region, the geographical region of China, it defines what is the Chinese nation in a way. Because even if you look at, if you just uh, open the hood and look at what lies beneath the uh, Chinese nation state, you will find that there are a multitude of beliefs, multitude of ethnicities. They have 56 ethnicities, they have 56 different ethnic groups and uh, what they call uh, uh, dialects. Uh, like you know uh, Hokkienese or Cantonese or Mandarin or Fahinese, they have multiple dialects and all these dialects if you look at it from our perspective they are mutually, mutually unintelligible. So effectively they are different languages. So China is also a multi multilingual state. Ethnically and racially China is also multi-ethnic and multi-racial. Multi-ethnic in the sense of you have uh, Mongols, you have Manchus, you have Tibetans, you have Uyghur, you have Hui who are Chinese, ethnic Chinese Muslims, you have the main Han peoples. In India, we have the same thing, we have multiple languages here. We have multiple peoples, ethnicities. So if you take somebody from the Punjab or from the, if you take undivided India, if you take somebody from Peshawar and you took somebody from Guwahati, they would look very different because physically they are of very different uh, uh, you know, physical characteristics as a group. But what knits together as them as a uh, nation is, uh, we will go to some of these principles. So let's look at the geographical bounds for what defines this nation. So we have a very specific geographic bound uh, right from the Vedic, Vedic period. In the Vedic period, it's always the description of this region is Asetu Himachala Paryantam from the region bounded on all three sides by the sea up to the snowy mountains. Himachala means Hima Achala, snowy mountains to the region bounded by the seas is the Bharata Desha. And if you look at the Puranic genealogy, Puranic uh, corpus, the Vishnu Purana very clearly specifies what is it that constitutes Bharata Varsha, Bharata Khanda and what are the boundaries? They do not include, they say that it is starting from Himachala to uh, the uh, uh, Setu, the uh, three, uh, uh, the three uh, oceans which bound the uh, physical geographical contours. They also specify clearly what are the uh, Malayachala, Vindhyachala and so on, all the mountain ranges that exist in this region. They specify the Punya Tirtha, Punya Nadi, which exists in this region. They specify the Punya Kshetra, the places, Ayodhya Puri, Kashi Puri, Kanchi Puri, Mathura Puri, all of them, they are Punya Puri. They call them Punya Puris. So there is a very clear definition of what are the places here, what are the mountains bounded by this uh, region, the Bharata Desha. And this Bharata Desha, therefore, there is a specific geography that our nation has identified with. So it's very clear as far as the geography is concerned. Race, in terms of race, again, I go back to Guruji. He says it's a hereditary society having common customs, common language, common memories of glories or disaster. In short, it is a population with common origin under a common culture. So if you look at, if we uh, if we look at uh, a certain uh, school of thought which says that the Tamils are a nation, Bengalis are a nation, Assamese are a nation, 
we are all different nations who happen to same share the same uh, geographic region i would very strongly and if you look at go back deeper in history you would find absolutely no evidence of such a linguistic basis for nations in this country there is absolutely no basis for such a regional na nationhood in this country there are genealogies of kings and these kings ruled over geographic regions but they never said none of these kings ever had this concept of nationhood we had tribes we had languages we had regions we had dynasties of kings but was there a nation that these kings ruled over i don't think so because there is no evidence saying that regardless of their language or regardless of their culture or regardless of their religion all people living in this region are of a nation that was never the state situation in any of the uh, pre british uh, pre modern uh, 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 dynasties or uh, states in india so we look at that as so if if there is anything to be seen there is a common culture which is again something which our uh, sangha or even before the sangha various uh, if you look at uh, the southernmost tip in the early part of the 19th century when uh, the first banner of revolt was uh, 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 unfurled against the british rule in the deepest southernmost part of region southernmost region of india by the marudu brothers what they were speaking about is that we are looking for independence for jambu dwipa they are very clear they said in the marudu proclamation the sri lanka sri rangam proclamation which uh, says that we would, will stop owing any allegiance or dealing with the company because we are children of this glorious nation which belongs to jambu dwipa and they are very clear they are not saying that i the ruler of shivaganga will stop playing paying uh, uh, obeisance or will stop paying uh, uh, taxes to the east india company they are saying that any of us who belongs to jambu dwipam is not bound by the laws of the east india company because they are different from us they are people who have come from outside they have different faiths they have different beliefs different practices so we cannot owe them allegiance so there is therefore if you say i mean not a genetic basis to our racial identity but there is a cultural basis to the racial identity and that is separate from the linguistic or the regional basis to our identity with uh, in terms of religion and uh, culture we in terms of religious beliefs uh, there is a lot of you know question about whether the hindu religion itself is a, constitutes a religion by itself or uh, whether we are just a set of beliefs which go under the garb of a religion or there are questions whether the word religion itself applies to the beliefs of people in this country the traditional beliefs of people in this country and there are uh, again there are questions about whether there is a difference between tribal animist beliefs or uh, traditional brahmanical hindu beliefs so if you look at practices if you look at the practices of tribal uh, communities in terms of how and what they constitute as uh, sacred and how they worship something which they see as sacred their concept of sacred spaces their concept of the sacred versus the profane you will see a common thread in the most uh, austere of i mean in the most traditional of vaidika belief you know your uh, uh, the, 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 the traditional vaidika beliefs like somayagam or uh, the uh, fire sacrificed centered uh, uh, centered belief systems versus a uh, completely uh, something the tribal beliefs which are completely supposed to be diverged from this reality you will find practices you will find the same world view so we are saying in terms of religion and culture we have a certain common thread whether it is a person living in uh, the mountains of uh, meghalaya or whether it is a, a person living on the banks of the kaveri or whether it is a person living in banaras there is a common religion there is a common religious world view an outlook so even traditionally if you took uh, uh, the heterodox sects uh, the nastikas uh, 
like the Jains or the certain Jaina sects or certain Bauddha sects. In terms of their worldview and their sense of Dharma and in terms of Shastra and in terms of even if you take uh, traditional uh, dynasties, religious dynasties or states which are governed by these principles, there was, we won't find any serious deviation from dynasties and rulers who were avowedly Vaidika in their outlook. So the outlook and the sense of right and wrong and dharma, you will find there is not a real di difference between the Nastika and the Astika sects. So there is a common sense of religion and culture which is common to across time and across sects which have uh, grown in this uh, country. Language, again a lot of the politics of language uh, and a lot of the politics of language, I believe, are a fairly recent phenomenon in the life of this country in terms of uh, politics around linguistic uh, uh, majorities, linguistic minorities and in terms of policies around uh, carving out states for administration on linguistic basis. Uh, it is my humble submission, I mean it is again open for discussion, it is my humble submission that these are derivatives of the Westphalian model which was developed in Europe for the purpose of defining nation states out of various principalities and small dukes, duchies and uh, uh, small kingdoms and small duchies and small principalities. There had to be some common principle around which a nation state had to be evolved in order to compete with a pre-existing nation states. The whole principle in my thinking, the whole purpose of the formation of the Nespalian nation state was competitive. They were hemmed in by a rising nation state, by a well risen nation state, the British nation state which had evolved out of multiple tribes and which had incorporated Celtic and Germanic tribes and on the other hand they had a Russian nation state which was, which had evolved around the uh, dynasty and the Russian language and the Eastern Orthodox religion and they felt hemmed in and all your, uh, the, the entire I believe a lot of the Westphalian nation states were around opposition and resistance and survival in the face of these two competitive forces. So if you had Germany which was unified in the first part of the 19th century or Italy which was unified in the second part of the 19th century, they had to, they, there was no common uh, culture. So they had to evoke and they had to evoke and they had to manufacture a certain mythos for their nation. So if you look at Italy, uh, there was a mythos created for their na nation. So uh, uh, one very interesting opera that you can see is uh, Verdi's Nabucco. In Nabucco, he talks about the, the story which is showed there, which shows there is about the Jewish nation, the Israelis, the Israel nation of Israel, which was uh, taken by uh, uh, and which uh, Abraham and later uh, uh, took out of uh, Mesopotamia and created a nation for themselves or later Moses and uh, there is a slaves chorus and the slaves chorus was, it was talking about the Jewish nation but they took all the uh, 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 sufferings and slavery of the Jewish nation and imagined upon themselves as an imaginary Italian nation and uh, this was the, uh, this was a, in, in a sense the, the uh, manufacture of a mythos and the manufacture of a grievance, a set of grievances which uh, later coalesced into the Italian nation state. And the same, uh, if you look at which uh, part of India has uh, followed that model almost to a T, uh, you would probably look at the Tamil region has uh, followed that, uh, has the manufacturing of a mythos, uh, 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 imaginary past lost in the mists of time when we were a glorious nation and now when we are uh, you know uh, enslaved by the Aryan North and uh, it will be interesting to you to say that you know many Tamil nationalist politicians uh, call themselves Garibaldi. Uh, they call themselves, uh, Vaiko is called uh, Kalingapatti Garibaldi, Kalingapatti is his village and uh, he is the Garibaldi of Kalingapatti. So they look back to Italian nationalists and the proto-fascists as their inspiration for how they want to evolve uh, Tamil nationalism. However, we believe that these are, uh, uh, these are uh, 
you know, flights of fancy and doomed to failure, in my opinion, because there was. Um, uh, so let's uh, that 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 being as that aside, um, another experiment set of experiments in nation state evolution, which I would like to you know kind of touch upon, is the Arab nationalists uh, and their experience in the Arab speaking countries. So um, in the 50s, after Gamal, Nasser, and uh, the period of pan-Arab nationalism. Uh, most of these states were basically artificially distinct, carved out. See, Iran has a civilization, it has a uh, you know, 4,000, 5,000 year history and a civilization and a culture and a common ethos around which a nation state can be structured around. What does Iraq have? Iraq has multiple peoples, multiple ethnic groups. The only thing that binds them together is that uh, about uh, uh, 700, 800 years ago, the Abbasid Caliphate used to operate out of that region and they were the cradle of civilization 4,500, 5,000 years ago. Other than that, the ethnic cities are vastly different. They have vastly different religions, languages, beliefs, faiths, customs and so on. Same case with Syria or, um, <clears throat> or even Egypt for that matter. Uh, where uh, and uh, or, or even the only thing that held them together was they were various vilayats under the Turkish Ottoman Empire and after the Ottoman Empire broke up they had something to create these they needed something to create these nation states around so everywhere if you look at a pattern you would see that a small minority which was uh, you know uh, which was not at all rooted for example if you take Syria the ruling minority is the Alawite Shiites, whereas the majority of the people are actually Sunni. And in Iraq, the ruling majority is Sunni Arabs, whereas the majority are Shiites. Or in uh, uh, in Egypt, you had a multicultural uh, ethos, and there the uh, the ruling ideology is that of Arab nationalism, of secular Arab nationalism. Or Turkey, where you have Kurd, a large Kurd population and uh, Turkish uh, population, both of whom speak different languages from different language families, but still which uh, from which tried to evolve a common Turkish nationalism. And everywhere, everywhere it has, if, if not now, it has ended up in some form of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Turkey has had nearly since its formation, since the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and the formation of the Turkish nation and state, and even before, uh, since the breakup, there have been at least five major genocides of Armenians, of Kurds, of uh, Circassians, of the Assyrians, an entire race, an entire ethnicity, the Assyrians with their own church, with their own beliefs, was completely wiped off the state of the face of the earth by the Turkish nationalists, by secular Turkish nationalists, mind you. These are secular people. The secular state of Iraq under Saddam Hussein conducted uh, bombing and chemical warfare campaigns against the Kurds who were their own subjects. So this is the, uh, this is the track record of these kind of artificial national nations uh, formed out of just because uh, some group of people happen to be sharing the same contiguous borders. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the situation in India, we were ruled by something similar to a Ba'athist dictatorship for quite a bit of good bit of time now that uh, we are out of that we can i can safely say that we were you know a, a, a lot of the characteristics that the neruvian regime shared with a lot of the bathist dictatorships where there was a small minority uh, of people whose ethos whose beliefs whose culture was largely inspired by a western model of uh, Western model of culture in terms of their what they thought was right or wrong in terms of their beliefs in terms of practices uh, who are also nationalist I mean I, I sincerely believe that you know they were not traitors I mean they were I don't think that Jawaharlal Nehru or I mean you can crucify me for saying this but I don't think Jawaharlal Nehru or Indira Gandhi or Rajiv Gandhi were exactly traitors to the nation they were nation nationalists and loyal to their own idea of what this nation was but they, they shared a lot of the similarities with the Ba'athists and if you look at it, a lot of 
uh, tensions are due to this, uh, you know, the setup of a uh, of of a regime at the center and of a distant ruling class, which was entirely divorced from what the real people out there in the provinces felt like, what they lived like, what they thought was right and wrong. And so, uh, I must say that it is only the dharmic ethos of this country which saved us from genocides and uh, uh, ethnic cleansing, even though there was one instance of ethnic cleansing, two ins instances of ethnic cleansing in Nagaland and in Kashmir. There were instances of ethnic cleansing, but luckily since it was not state sponsored, it did not evolve into all out mass genocide. But that's, that's, that's just something that we escaped due to our dharmic ethos. And so my point is that where I'm coming from is that my point is that we have to completely reject these forms of Baathist nationalists uh, uh, ideas of what a nation state ought to be, uh, the Arab nationalists. Syrian, Syrian in the, the, the Syria had a Baath party. The Baath party ruled Syria. Saddam Hussein was part of the Baath party which ruled uh, Iraq and there was a Baath party in uh, uh, Egypt also, pan-Arab nationalists. So the nationalism was Arab nationalism where it was beyond religion or beyond uh, ethnicity. Uh, you could be Shiite or you could be a Sunni or you could be a Kurd. <coughs> But your uh, loyalty uh, was to the Iraqi nation, to the Arab nation, Arab Iraqi nation. So that was the. Uh, so th my principle is that we must reject this form of nationalism because it has not, wherever this form of nationalism has uh, been applied, it has done, it hasn't done any good uh, to its uh, to its citizens. And so, if we look at the common factors, race, religion and culture, country and language, we have a common ethos, there is a common base language in terms of grammar, in terms of syntax, in terms of script. All of these scripts are evolved from the same uh, Brahmic family of scripts. You have the same structure, the, uh, uh, the Kavarga, Tavarga, Chavarga kind of structure to all our alphabets. You have uh, the same very similar rules of grammar. The syntax and the vocabulary might change depending on state to state, depending on region to region. But there is a common li link language and uh, if I may say so, uh, till very recent times our common link language was Sanskrit. If a person wanted to discuss a point of grammar, logic and grammar, uh, if a person in Kerala wanted to discuss grammar uh, with a person in Bengal, uh, the common point would be Sanskrit. So, there has to be a common point uh, and uh, this is not at the expense of regional languages, but the point is that our, uh, our language Vyavahara, language of Vyavahara, of business, of uh, the courts, of the government has to be in Indian languages. We have to evolve into an Indian language based system because we are working, our courts work, our governments work in language which only 5% of our population has some level of proficiency over. It's, it, you can see it in our papers. You look at the circulation figures of uh, an English language newspaper versus Hindi or Tamil or Bengali and the differences are pretty stark. So, uh, going beyond the idea of nationhood, now assume that we had this nation had uh, could have the option to kind of start afresh and define what the state, the Hindu Swarajya, if it could rule itself entirely as per its uh, values, what would it probably look like? So, uh, if we look at, I start with the economy and uh, I look at, uh, you know, various uh, aspects of economic affairs, whether it is taxation, whether it is regulation, whether it is ownership of uh, activity, who owns activity. Uh, there is no real, uh, a lot of it has been based on pragmatic uh, principles and the situation at that point in time with a few basic principles. So, our uh, traditionally, we have never been, you know, a completely laissez-faire capitalist kind of uh, economy, nor have we been a complete socialist kind of economy. And uh, for this in modern times, uh, one thinker that we must go back to is uh, Sri Dattopan Tengdi, uh, 
who formed the Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh, the largest uh, trade union in India is the Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh and the largest farmers union in India is the Bharatiya Kisan Sangh, both of which were formed by Dhattopan Tengdi. Dhattopan Tengdi was not a socialist. He said the socialist principles had limited utility and he predicted the collapse of communism really a decade before its time. What his principle was, so the principle of Dhatopan Tengadi was a third way, a third way based on our ideas of economy, our idea of what is good for the economy, in that there must be a role for collective bargaining. There has to be a role for people to associate and form guilds for themselves, trade union guilds or trade guilds for uh, specific skilled craftsmen so that they could have collective bargaining rights so that they could collaborate with each other and so on and so forth. But not in an adversarial position where it was a capital versus labor kind of adversarial position and the scales would constantly keep tilting in favor of the state, scales of the government would keep tilting in favor of one or the other. But always where the scale of the government was always in the favor of what is in the best interest of most people. So that was his uh, enunciation of the third way. And uh, if we go back into history, in terms of prescriptive texts, the Arthashastra, if you go through the Arthashastra, it is prescriptive in terms of, it gives a very, the picture that the Arthashastra gives is of a very highly regulated economy. There were regulations for uh, ferries, operation of ferries, regulations for uh, production of cotton, production of silk, production of uh, fabrics. For any aspect, there was regulation for, you know, there was regulation for production and sale of liquor. In fact, in some cases, he even recommends that the state itself take over the sale of liquor, that it purchase product, uh, the purchase product produced liquor and sell the liquor, state itself sell the liquor. And he even gives directions on how the bars should be run. So, uh, or uh, if it is shocking to people, they even describes how uh, you know, uh, houses of EC virtue should be uh, run, or should be operated. He specifies who should be in charge of the establishment, what kind of people should be recruited for the establishment, you know, you must have X number of musicians, the place must be kept clean, so on and so forth. So, this uh, idea that we were somehow a hands-off, laissez-faire, uh, you know, uh, uh, economy or a uh, that uh, 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 you know that some ultra capitalist uh, people try to think is actually uh, fairy tale. Uh, it's 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 been uh, in fact uh, uh, it's 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 been between some amount of uh, uh, you know lax regulations and some amount of tight regulations. And in terms of the operation of the state and the operation of the economy, the biggest horror that almost all our Indian thinkers have had is that of anarchy. The biggest horror, the worst thing that could happen to a state is when the Matsya Nyaya takes effect, where the smaller fish are eaten up by the bigger fish. And that is an absolute no-no as far as the uh, Indian thinkers are concerned. Anarchy is absolutely not uh, uh, a preferred state. It's not a preferred state by any means. But then uh, if you look at the Chinese model, they have a great... Uh, love for harmony. The word that you will see uh, in Chinese uh, texts and by when, even when the Chinese uh, leaders, political leaders speak, they always speak about social or political or harmony. They speak about harmony between nations. In terms of Indian uh, thinkers, they speak about order and rule of law, which is always their uh, uh, way they have thought about things. And if you look at it, the Indian model always recommends, it always talks about somebody on top, a certain individual or a king on top. It, it talks about tempering the individual's uh, proclivities through a council. So it even in, in, if you look at again, if we go back to Kautilya, Kautilya gives in detail uh, prescriptions for how you should be selecting ministers and who should be the ministers and how many ministers you should have, what should be their responsibilities. And eventually it works out to uh, number of 8 or 9 is the uh, uh, prescription that he gives. He says you can start from 6 and 
may be close to 9 or 10 close circle, the inner council or probably an uh, empowered EGOM, empowered group of ministers which he, which he prescribes. And if you look at Indian history, almost all the uh, kings who have ha said to have run very efficient administrations, you will see that they had Navaratnas or Ashtadiggajas. Uh, so, Krishna Devaraya or uh, Vikramaditya, the, whichever Vikramaditya I talk about or Akbar who is said to have run a very efficient administration, you will see that they had a uh, empowered group of ministers who are 8 or 9 people with each of them having specific uh, 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 responsibilities and uh, areas which they look at. Uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure, the model which very often worked was where the local infrastructure was largely funded, managed locally. So, for example, if you had uh, uh, Professor Bajaj has done a lot of work on traditional waterworks. On one very important factor in an agrarian economy is water, especially where we large parts of the country get rains only in a part of the year and the rest of the year you have to survive with either on the basis of perennial rivers. If you are on the banks of a perennial river like the Godavari or the Kaveri, you are doing well. But very few parts of the country actually had, were co-situated with the with a perennial river like that. There were parts of the country which had to do without a perennial river, where the irrigation was rain fed and through tanks. And there, uh, Professor Bajaj has gone out into the uh, villages of North Tamil Nadu. And there is a very evolved system of local self-governance for water, managing water. So, when the British came, uh, in terms of uh, things like policing was very was ultra local policing was ultra local water management was ultra local the focus for water management would probably be about 5 to 6 villages which congregated around a tank or 5 to 6 villages we were which were along the banks of a river of a river and which would talk about how they would share the canals and how they would share the water between themselves and professor bajaj talks about a man a certain man uh, who had a hereditary function uh, he was called the Kambangati. In Tamil, it means Kambam means a pole, and he Kati means tie a pole. So this man would tie a pole, and he had this this thing. He had a kind of system of uh, uh, locks by which he would release water to a specific village at specific points in time, and another village at another point in time. And this man was lived away from all of these villages. And since this man lived away from all of the villages, it was assumed that he was an untouchable, and they were later categorized into the one of the Dalit uh, communities in Tamil Nadu. But actually this man was a very powerful man because he controlled the waterworks for four or five villages and since he had to be neutral, he was not part of any village, he was in the middle of all of these villages, so he was neutral and whenever there was any dispute between villages, even if it is not related to waterworks, they used to come to this man because he was independent of the village, the same way as the, uh, the Brahmin communities used to live outside the village in the Agrahara. And in the Agrahara, because they were not related to any village, people used to come here for, uh, you know, arbitration because these people were seen as neutral. Same way this Kambangati, this man who was later put into a Dalit community, that man was seen as neutral and people of the village would come to him for arbitration. Anyway, I digress. The point is that a lot of the arbitration, water management, policing was hyper-local. There was another system uh, whereby, you know, there was a, a community called the Kalar, Piramarai Kalar, who had responsibility in a few uh, palayams or uh, uh, states, micro states, uh, regions. They had responsibility for local police. So, the principle was that the village gives a part of their produce, of the collected produce, which would be collected as uh, revenue for the temple, local temple or for the local uh, village assembly. A part of that produce was given to this man. It was a hereditary function and the family got a part of the village's produce and their job was to be the guard, uh, guard of the village, guard, guard as in the uh, policeman for the village. And uh, the principle was that if a particular property was lost, the man has, was given three days to recover that property, failing which a portion of the property's value would be recovered from his uh, share of the village's revenue. So, uh, when the British came, they said, we will give you a police station. They said, we already have this person to take care of our things. And they said, this man, I just need to go and tell him. And usually the network among this community, they were all part of the same community. 
and this network among people in the uh, surrounding you know 20 30 villages was so good that uh, a thief i mean in those days a thief could either run or walk or take a bullock cart or whatever if he took a bullock cart he would be seen if he rode a horse he would be seen so he would be noticed immediately so a thief had to run so how far can he run within two three days he would probably go five villages away or six villages away and uh, the network would usually catch up with him and he would be brought back so these people said uh, we have this system he said we will put a police station in your village and how will the guy who will come to the run the police station will it be this man they said no we will appoint somebody who's trained and uh, how do i tell him he doesn't know me he said no you have to write and give him a complaint so they said uh, but we don't know to write and uh, so they said we will employ a person called a writer who will listen to you who will write down your complaints and give it to that person in the police station they said we don't need it we don't need to write anything and this is already working and uh, for this piece of wisdom the colors were uh, made were notified as a criminal tribe so these people there were 72 different communities in just the madras presidency which were notified as criminal tribes which means a child born in the tribe from its birth is seen as a criminal so among these communities there were these god uh, local uh, policemen communities then there were uh, people like narikoravas which is another community which was a nomadic community and they used to bring they were a kind of a uh, uh, you know the logistics network or the lohanas or the uh, lambadis in andhra pradesh uh, telangana region all of these communities were uh, notified as criminal tribes and uh, uh, basically anything happens the simple thing was even today uh, there is a if you, if you see the list in some of the remote parts of uh, southern india uh, the non delicant list it's called the kd list non delicant list will have people from these tribes so anything happens something gets stolen pick up somebody from the nearby camp uh, narikorava camp and bring him to prison keep him in lock up so uh, in terms of uh, juris jurisprudence and uh, legal systems uh, kautilya actually in the arthashastra he speaks of a adversarial system which is very similar to uh, our current system where you have a defendant and a plaintiff and they both submit their case to the uh, legal system and they have to there is a system of proof and there is a system that if the defendant gives a response then the plaintiff has a limited amount of time to give back his uh, rejoinder to the uh, defendant's response and so that so basically it was an adversarial system and kautilya recommends about uh, judges be appointed in border areas and in uh, almost every sub district however he doesn't talk about uh, adjudication and arbitration at the village level where it was largely run on the uh, principle of the sabha uh, the local uh, gram sabha would uh, take care of the uh, 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 jurisdiction and the uh, i mean the jury, judicial process in terms of uh, <clears throat> so moving on to foreign policy uh, whether our foreign policy was traditionally pacifist is a big question my contention is that at no point in time independent of uh, uh, any external rulers at no point in time has the foreign policy of any uh, hindu state been pacifist in nature in terms of actively going out to avoid war the principle was always that you avoided war if you needed to as long as you could afford to avoid war and the principle was that if it's not that you uh, you could enter into a war on your own terms also without you know uh, without provocation uh, when i say without provocation uh, i mean uh, in terms of uh, so uh, in terms of what a ruler and the ruling class of a country should do kautilya prescribes that you should always be looking to improve your interests have your interests in mind and constantly look at enhancing and strengthening your interests whether at home or abroad and he says if you can gain if you can gain an advantage go ahead and you can play off kings against each other or you know make alliances or even go to war where if it is seen as territory that is very advantageous and you need that territory for whatever purpose so it was not explicitly pacifist ever and the evidence is pretty clear 
because if you look at it, the geographic contours of what constituted the Aryavarta, the region which was suitable for inhabitant, inhabit, uh, inhabitation, habitation by the Aryas, Bodhayana, which is about 800 BC or so, 800 years before Christ, at the earliest reckoning, Bodhayana recommends uh, that the regions south of the Vindhyas and towards the east of the Mahanadi, essentially Orissa, uh, those regions are not fit for inhabitation by the Varyas because there is not sufficient, uh, you know, they do not have kings who carry out the uh, prescribed sacrifices and so on. But if you look at uh, where the uh, traditional centers, today's traditional centers of Vedic learning are actually in all those regions which Bodhayana has recommended as out of beyond the pale for Aryas. And Bodhayana actually recommends taking a bath if you go there and you, if you come back into the Arya region of Aryas, he says the sacrifices are not held there on a regular basis and the rulers are heretics, Pashandas and therefore since that region is ruled by Pashandas, you must come back and uh, you know, conduct expiatory rites, certain prayashitams. Uh, the maximum number of people who buy, follow the Bodhayana Dharma Shastram actually live in the regions which he originally called as uh, Milecha regions. So, which is a, so in, so if you look at it, there is no, uh, if you had a pacifist and inward looking foreign policy, uh, we would not have progressed much further beyond, uh, uh, you know, Agra and Mathura. Uh, the fact that we reached all the way to uh, Bali and we were all the way extent all the way from Afghanistan till uh, Bali and in fact even further beyond uh, Thailand uh, or even further beyond to Thailand's uh, Korea, there is a founding story of a princess from Ayodhya who came to uh, Korea and uh, the entire ruling uh, dynasty of Korea descended from this princess from Ayodhya. So, if we had really been uh, so inward looking and pacifist, uh, we would never have, uh, uh, you know, uh, got that far. And uh, if you believe that, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, all kinds of people just were so enamored by our culture and our superior, vastly superior philosophies that they took it up wholesale, well, maybe, but without a military aspect, there is no expansion, which is, which is, which is, uh, you know, the fact of uh, life. So, they were expansionism was uh, was not uh, out of uh, the bounds of Indian foreign policy, traditional Indian foreign policy. Does that mean that a new Hindu Rashtra or a Hindu Rajya that we set up, if, if we do get a chance to set up a Hindu Swarajya, will it be expansionist? Uh, maybe yes, but will it be expansionist in a traditional sense in terms of invading countries and colonizing them? Maybe not. It could probably be expansionist in the way the Japanese are expansionist or in the way the uh, um, uh, or in the way the, uh, the best example are the Japanese where they are pretty much expansionist in terms of trade and in terms of soft cultural uh, artifacts which they give, which they own but they which uh, people adopt. It's still the Karate and uh, all those Japanese Zen Buddhism, the, the Japanese still own them but people, other people from other cultures can adopt them and they sell and they buy things and goods and services from other countries. So, they have a large footprint without trying to impose their cultural values or without trying to capture territory uh, uh, directly. So, that's, it's, it's, uh, uh, Hindu Swarajya would probably look in, in its terms of Hindu, Hindu Swarajya would probably look similar to a Japanese uh, kind of expansionist uh, world post World War II Japanese expansionism. In terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the state itself, uh, you know, I have thought about this and people discuss, this is again, this is B, huh? this is just my, my, my personal, uh, you know, thought. And uh, uh, we have thought in terms of, you know, a constitutional monarchy and uh, the experience of uh, experience of constitutional, semi-constitutional monarchies in recent times in India. Uh, you cannot get a similar ex expansion, but ex similar, uh, uh, directly similar experience in India. But I would like to draw parallels between the experience of Travancore as a state uh, versus Japan as a state. Uh, Travancore before Martha Varma, the Travancore region was ruled by 
was full of small principalities, feudal in nature, and uh, most of whom were uh, traditional aristocrat, uh, dynastic aristocrats, the Rajas and the various Nayars and so on. And uh, before Vartandavarma, the, there was no real ruler at uh, Travancore or near titular head. But after Marthandavarma, it was similar to the Maiji restoration in, in terms of the traditional feudal dynasties uh, see their importance uh, diminished drastically, especially the Etivital Pillamar, the dynasty, the eight feudal chieftains, Pillamar chieftains, whose uh, influence was drastically diminished in terms of in, in favor of a centralized uh, powerful monarchy. And what has our experience been? With this monarchy, uh, the, it was always a progressive uh, region uh, uh, as compared to the rest of the country. And some of the very important uh, social changes which came about in India, I will just take uh, one very important social change which is the temple entry, which is where we constitutionally we are bound to give access to the temple to people from all parts of the society without restrictions. The, uh, the very first proclamation in India was made by the Travancore state, the Temple Entry Proclamation in Travancore state and almost every state, every before and after independence, whether it is Mysore or the later presidencies, Madras, Calcutta and Bombay presidencies, which adopted it, adopted some aspect of the progressive Temple Entry Proclamation from Travancore. If you look at uh, Dr. Ambedkar's experience, own experience, the people, uh, it was not uh, British or uh, any, uh, you know, the uh, traditional British Raj which supported him in his endeavours. His, it was Shahuji Maharaj of Satara and later on the Gaikwad king of Baroda who supported him and uh, who helped him out when he needed certain financial uh, help. So, in terms of uh, progressive behaviour, uh, the behavior of the states, traditional princely states, some of the pr traditional princely states, in terms of uh, universal education, Travancore was the, one of the earliest states to make primary education universal and accessible to all parts of society. And if you look at the noon meal scheme, the early precursor of the noon meal scheme was in Travancore state under Raja Chitra Tirnal, and you should not of course, under uh, Sir C.P. Ramswami Ayer, who was the uh, Diwan and uh, the Raja Chitra Tirunal, the noon meal scheme was one of the earlier thing, early early schemes which was carried out. And later on, it was just uh, adopted in Tamil Nadu by the Kamraj uh, government, and now it is uh, pretty much a standard thing which happens across every Indian state. And this has been a game changer in terms of improving literacy levels, in terms of improving nutrition, in terms of improving overall quality of life of the Indian public. So, the uh, if I if you look at so coming back to my point our experience with uh, monarchies enlightened Hindu monarchies has not been all that bad. So, uh, possibly a constitutional monarchy with a rotating uh, kingship between uh, certain between Jaipur, Travancore, Mysore, the Chhatrapatis and so on between maybe 10 or 15 senior well thought of uh, princely families may not be as outlandish an idea as we think of it. So, just a thought. In terms of uh, social services, uh, what would it look like? Uh, typical social services that we uh, look at are education, healthcare and social welfare. So, traditionally, um, our Gandhian thinkers, uh, most notably Dharampal, Sri Dharampalji has in his book A Beautiful Tree has written about the availability of primary education for all children up to a certain age and up to a certain level of proficiency and after which uh, you know children would usually branch off into different uh, areas, uh, usually hereditary. You know potters would take up pottery, sculptors would take up sculpture and uh, uh, people uh, and where the advanced colleges, they he talked about advanced colleges where subjects like grammar and philosophy and logic and so on were taught and the classics, uh, either Tamil classics or Kannada classics or the Sanskrit classics were taught 
and he talks about enrollment in these advanced colleges and he says that it was not only Brahmins, there was about a 30-40% representation of Brahmins in these advanced colleges which was a little out of proportion to their population because the population of Brahmins were never exceeded more than 10% in any part of the Madras presidency of the time and their representation in the colleges, advanced traditional Indian colleges, the Pachalas was about 30-40% to 40 and there was another 40-50% to 50 representation by uh, 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 you know uh, the forward communities which were non-Brahmin upper caste communities like the Shaiva Velalar or uh, uh, Nair and such uh, upper caste communities and there was probably about 10 to 15 percent representation of agricultural castes even in the uh, advanced uh, colleges. So, uh, we would not probably adopt that same system but we would probably adopt a system of uh, various streams of study uh, which branch off at a relatively earlier stage. And for this we have uh, some models which we could adopt especially from the west. Uh, Germany for example has the, uh, has the principle of the Hawk school, high schools the, and the, and the uh, vocational schools. So right at the age of about 14 or so there is an evaluation, there is an evaluation at the 10th age year uh, and there is an evaluation at the 13th age for children and based on what they, uh, they, they, they demonstrate they can either take advanced uh, subjects in uh, theoretical subjects or they are moved into vocational streams of training where they actually learn crafts and by the 18th year they can actually finish their education with a useful trade in hand. Now in India of today it would be very contentious because a uh, lot of advanced, uh, a lot of the advanced subjects so for example if you want to take calculus or if you want to take uh, 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 Newton's uh, laws in a more advanced stage, if you want to take mechanics, it involves a lot of abstract thought and a lot of that ad abstract thought is presented in English to children who are not from English speaking families. So if my kid who where we have a, where we are comfortable with English at home goes into an English medium school, he would be better placed to pick up these advanced concepts as opposed to a kid who comes from a family where they do not speak English at home. So, automatically this gives a, ch a child a handicap when the child is being evaluated and it would based on their birth it would push these children into vocational training or into advanced theoretical subjects. So, I this would definitely it is not a perfect situation for Indian situation for our uh, stage in evaluation until and unless we get a certain either we, we have to level the playing field either by making universal primary education in uh, the native language of the child where any child whether it is from an upper middle class background or from a working class background goes to the same school, gets taught by the same teachers and learns in the same language, they learns the same subjects in the same language at the 10th uh, till the 10th year of age, 10th age or the 13th age. Then if you do an evaluation, the evaluation would be comparing apples to apples. But if you do an English medium school and you do and if you try to normalize across schools, if you normalize a school where you pay 1.5 lakh per year versus a school where you pay 15,000 rupees per year, the it will not really work in the Indian context. So, uh, even though there is something, some value to be had in the traditional means, traditional Indian system of education, uh, it cannot be, uh, you know, it cannot be uh, fair uh, to apply unless you apply the same thing that you, everybody goes to the same universal same kind of uh, schools. Uh, so that said in terms of social welfare, in terms of food security, uh, we have certain in very close to modern times we have well documented uh, stories about the states uh, of uh, South India, the Madurai and Tanjavur states both under the Madurai Nayaks and the Tanjavur Nayaks and later the Tanjavur Marathas. So we have evidence of uh, the last uh, the last few rulers of uh, the Marathas, last few Maratha rulers of Tanjavur, Sarboji and before him Tuljaji and Amarsim, Amarasimha, all of these people had run Annachatrams, many number of Annachatrams where food was given for free, much like the Langars that the Sikh Gurdwaras run. 
you could go there travelers could go there stay there for a certain period of time and they would be fed food for free uh, in fact uh, sarboji uh, the last uh, raja of uh, maratha ruler of tanjavur uh, he had a wife uh, among one of his wives he had a wife uh, uh, whom he was very attached to and she died in childbirth so in her memory he actually set up the uh, chatrams a series of chatrams which were specifically for pregnant women where pregnant women could come and uh, they could they would be fed if you if uh, any woman got pregnant regardless of who she was where she was from she would come there she would be given specific whatever chikitsa ayurveda medicines to help her with the pregnancy and she would be given fed uh, and she could even given she would, if required she would be given space in a common dormitory if it was some lady who was uh, destitute who had got pregnant she would be given space in a dormitory where she could stay till childbirth and take her child with her and then after that she could come and uh, get herself a glass of milk every evening if she was feeding her baby so if you look at the kind of so uh, if you look at today's uh, uh, upper middle class thinking a lot of people will say that it will make people lazy i beg to differ because it will make people lazy only if there is no social penalty associated with taking this if you look at it in those times people if you went and ate in a chatram it was a uh, socially you had come down in the world and it was a great deal of there was certain sense of shame that you could not take care of yourself and so people would try to get out of this support automatically by themselves without relying on the state beyond a certain point when they were totally destitute and uh, uh, this kind of utilitarian this uh, you know uh, view point that it makes people lazy is something that the british uh, administration used to say whenever there was a famine they refused to distribute food among the people saying that it would make them lazy and dependent on the government uh, uh, government uh, resources and the results were that millions of people actually starved to death uh, during the british raj so uh, there's absolutely no reason uh, to not give free food to uh, and it's very much part of the dharmic ethos and very much part of our uh, social security systems and uh, if you look at all our uh, whether it was all done by the government no there was the government had only a limited role to play in this the government would usually get out of the way when there was a private uh, party which was uh, providing it and usually these private parties there were uh, different types of private parties uh one was the temple itself the regional temples itself used to run anachatrams free food they used to run uh, chikitsalaya uh, uh, hospitals or hospices uh, they used to run goshalas animal shelters all of these were run by the temples and even if the temples were not doing it the uh, wealthy money class uh, so during the early part of the 20th century when no state support was forthcoming for veda patshalas in tamil nadu uh, the tradition was for the chettiar merchants or business people to run the patshalas so the early part of the 20th century a lot of the vedic pandits actually came out of chetti patshalas they used to call them chetti patshalas because they were run by the chettiars and the business people used to run patshalas they used to run goshalas they used to run anna chatrams even today there is a community the nagarattar community natukote nagarattar community one of the most famous uh, uh, dharamshalas in kashi is run by these people and they have been running it for centuries it's run by the community it's run efficiently uh, and it's run by the community and they have running it in kashi similarly you have gujarati uh, banias running dharamshalas in madurai and rameshwaram so there was a pan indian sense that you know you feed travelers you feed the destitute and you take care of so there was a space for this uh, business community to do it there was a space also for the agricultural community to do it there were uh, local uh, people usually through the ages of the temple or through the gram sabha used to run uh, the local trade guild for example used to run uh, certain uh, relief uh, work for example if you look at uh, <coughs> any temple towns again my experience has largely been from the south so many of these temple towns they have these jati guilds jati guilds will run specific uh, dharamshalas which is available to everybody but their people from their own community will get first preference 
but a lot of them are from the middle class, uh, middle castes, the agricultural castes. A lot of the uh, dharamshalas and uh, chatrams are run by the agricultural castes uh, who pool money as part of their uh, caste, uh, their caste association pools money and runs this as a uh, uh, charity endeavor. So, uh, I'd like to finally come to the point of view of the state and uh, what place the state has in religious affairs and conducting the religious affairs of people. And uh, uh, there is this uh, notion that the state must be equidistant from all faiths, <coughs> uh, regardless of what the faith is. And the uh, frequent quotation that is uh, provided in uh, its favor is that Ekam Sat Vipra Bhauda Vadanti. So, if it is Ekam Sat Vipra Bhauda Vadanti, it is not that everybody who says something is right. The Vadin has to be a Vipra. It has to be a wise person who is saying. It cannot be anybody who says everything and uh, it is right. So, you have to evaluate what is being said in the light of certain standards and you then can accept or reject. And then the state may decide to step in or not. So, the, uh, historically there is a, the background is that uh, 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 we have many uh, uh, historical uh, evidences. So, I will take a couple of them. One of them is Mahendra Pallavan. Mahendra Pallavan has written the Matta Vilasa. It is a prahasana. It is a comedy in which he, uh, you know, he lampoons. He is a king. Mahendra Pallavan is the king who rules over a pretty large empire, a large uh, territory and he in his capacity as king writes a prahasana where he lampoons uh, uh, the beliefs of the Kapalikas, he lampoons the Baudhas, he lampoons the Jainas strongly and performs strong kandanam on their faiths and on their beliefs. And uh, there is another example is the Agamadambara by Jayanta Bhatta. Jayanta Bhatta was uh, he was actually a minister of Kashmir and in his Agamadambara, he says that anything which should be accepted as acceptable to be practiced in our state, it should have a widely acknowledged unbroken tradition. Aryas or decent people should not be repelled by associating with it or by discussing it. It should not be antisocial or dangerous. It should not be based on the ramblings of a madman. So, there are certain Middle Eastern gentlemen who come to mind in this respect and uh, on something outlandish, it should not be based on greed, it cannot be used for just about any text, they should be enunciated by trustworthy, per we should, they should be enunciated by trustworthy persons and they should have no beginning or they should be based on Vedic tradition. We will not allow this claim of validity for any scripture in which duties which are contemptible are taught, such as Ill, you know, illicit or repulsive sexual practices or eating and drinking impure foods. So, if they recommend such things, we will not you know, tolerate these faiths. And uh, the proof of the pudding was there was a sect called the Neela Pathas who were used to wear blue, apparently they used to wear blue clothes they were expelled from the state and they were this the practice of this religion was forbidden because the basis of this uh, uh, expulsion was that they practiced obscene acts in public. Uh, it is not specified actually what these obscene acts were but there was something which was repulsive in their behavior and the same way the Kapalikas were actually discouraged very strongly because of their behavior, uh, certain behaviors uh, of theirs. Um, with respect to you know uh, alcohol and uh, sexual behavior there was a lot of uh, behavior which was away from the norm and uh, it was frowned upon and these people were strongly discouraged so in that sense it's not a perfectly uh, secular state in the modern sense of the term it will not be a secular state in the modern sense of the term the state will have certain uh, beliefs and certain standards for evaluating faiths and religious beliefs and whether to accept certain religious beliefs or not. So, uh, that uh, is about uh, religion. I had some more uh, subjects on uh, local self-government and so on, but then I would be repeating some of this material and just embellishing them with more data. So, I am done with the uh, my exposition of my thoughts.